thanks for the introduction. I'm here today to talk about the National Mental Health Workforce Plan. Um, I'm here on behalf of my boss, Lisa Bayliss-Pratt, who's Chief Nurse for HEE um, and is the National SRO for Mental Health. Um, so I'll be, although I'm a London uh, Director for HEE and the Regional Lead for Mental Health, I'm talking about the national programme today. Um, I'll just do that. I don't think this needs any introduction. I know that this is the topic um, of the day, the, the five-year forward view for mental health. And within the five-year forward view for mental health, there was a signposting that there needed to be a considerable amount of thought um, and planning and action around the workforce agenda. So stepping forward, which was published in July 17, um, is that workforce response to the mental health forward view. And I won't ask people to indicate whether or not they've read it. Um, I just um, hope that people are familiar with this this document um, and that are seeing the impact of it in the environments um, that you work in. Broadly speaking, what Stepping Forward does um, is to establish where we are now, where we want to be, and how we're going to get there. Um, and I think it's important to stress right from the outset that this is not an HEE policy, although we are heavily invested in this, keen to own it um, and lead on, on the implementation of it. This is a system-wide um, change piece, if you like. Um, I've not worked on anything quite like it um, in my career, and it feels very different in the way that there's kind of recognition that everybody wants this, that everybody believes this is the right thing to do, and the only way that we'll achieve it is if the whole system, and that's not just the NHS, but the wider um, health and care system, uh, you know, work together very hard to, to, make, to make this change happen. Me. So the, if you haven't read Stepping Forward and if you haven't heard of it before or seen anything about it, I can basically sum it up in a sentence. The whole premise of the policy is that we want to see massive growth in the workforce caring for people who have mental health issues. Um, and that growth is in the region of 19 to 20,000 additional people by 2021. And the reason I say in the region of is because depending on how service models change and depending on how commissioners and service providers decide to sort of deploy their resources and, and develop their local strategies, it will change um, to some extent that number. But if you basically know that what Stepping Forward is all about is an extra 20,000 or so people in the workforce by 2021, given the environment that we're operating in at the moment, that is an absolutely huge challenge. But as I said a moment ago, it's a challenge that the system signed up to, so all of the ALBs, providers, um, and you know, STPs, and all of the people who, who are influential in the system have agreed that this, this is what we want to do. Um, and as I've said already, there is recognition that this is just not NHS employed staff. So I don't want people in the audience thinking, you know, they're just looking at mental health trusts, they're not thinking about the wider thing. We absolutely are. It's hard to think about the wider workforce. You know, it's not as easy to count, it's not as easy to see. Those of us working in the NHS, it's not as easy to understand, perhaps, but the, the, uh, I, ho I hope that there are people here, and um, my colleague on the panel, we were just talking about a meeting we were at together when we were uh, presenting to the voluntary sector. We are really trying to reach far and wide with this, and um, if anybody would like me to put them in touch with their regional leads or have a further conversation about how this is working, I'd be more than happy to do that. Now, I'm not going to talk through this in detail, I haven't got time, um, but the main point um, of showing you this, this is, this is uh, the main, what we describe as the waterfall diagram within the Stepping Forward document. Um, and this basically shows a way that we could get to this additional 20,000 growth. The green line that goes acro across the top of the graph shows how patient demand and activity is growing. So we know all the time that we're doing anything that, that the, the demand on our services is growing, and that's what that green line demonstrates. Now, I think a common... A misconception, if you like, whenever we talk about any of these types of policies, and we've got similar debates going on in primary care and urgent and emergency care and cancer and so on, is that it's all about supply. We need 20,000 more people, great. Let's have some more psychiatrists, some more, more mental health nurses, and we'll be fine. And that is just absolutely not the answer. Um, and I'll show you some figures about how the workforce is growing and how we are 
um, getting a lot of newly qualified people and so on into the workforce. But what this diagram does, which is quite neat, is it shows the ebb and flow, if you like, of how, of how the, the labour market is very dynamic and how things will change. So, you know, some of it is about newly established posts. Absolutely, some of it is. Where there's a red on the diagram, it shows people that are going to leave the workforce. Because, of course, between now and 2021, loads of people will leave. We're not just growing by 20,000. That's a flat number. We've got to compensate for people who are retiring, giving up, changing their lifestyles, whatever, which means they're leaving the workforce. So you'll see the ebbs and flows of that diagram. And another thing I just would um, point out from there is that there's a, a huge emphasis on retention. So, and, I, and Tim and I just had a quick chat at a coffee thing a few minutes ago. I'm really glad that um, everything he was saying really resonates with, with what, what, what we're saying in this presentation because if we could just retain the workforce that we had, not for five or ten years, for two or three years, we would make an absolutely astronomical difference to, to the level of vacancies and to the challenge that we have. And it's not just about retaining people, it's about reskilling them, improving the offer to the workforce, making mental health a better offer for the workforce, better career pathways, more opportunities, different types of roles. And that is such a huge part of this. And I think with any of these things, we get very hung up on supply because it's actually quite tangible. How many students are there in university? How many of them want to be psychiatrists? Great. They're in the bag. And actually, the harder stuff around the edge is the, is the stuff that really also makes a huge difference and we need to concentrate on. This slide, sort of a little bit helpful, just shows um, comparative growth of staff groups and mental health over the last few years, just to give you an example that sometimes what you want to happen isn't what's happening. Um, so in the middle, you've got psychiatrists, that grey line. The top line is clinical psychology and the bottom line is mental health nurses. Now, I'm not sure any of us would say that between the years of February 12 and August 16, that would have been what we would have planned to have happened. Certainly, with the mental health nursing, that is absolutely not what we want to have happened. Um, psychiatry, you'll see, is fairly stable. Um, some parts of the country really struggle to fill their psychiatry training programmes. I was just talking... Um, to a colleague on the panel now about the work that the Royal College of Psychiatry are doing to encourage people to choose psychiatry and all of that's very powerful. Um, but what we've got to get to is a place whereby we've got more of a grip of this and actually in the current um, sort of labour market and the way that education funding has reformed and so on, it's actually quite hard for us to have that grip. Um, so, so there's lots and lots of challenge um, in this agenda. So if I just go back to the focus of the programme, um, there's a huge focus on population health and public health. And actually, when we've engaged with STPs and commissioners and people who are planning strategies for their services, um, they actually have challenged stepping forward and said, we want more of an emphasis on prevention and early intervention than that. We can do better than that. You know, we want to stop people getting ill. That's part of our local strategy, and that's how we want to work. So when I said the 20,000 is a sort of movable feast, that's because some STPs being really ambitious about their prevention agenda. And that would then require a smaller workforce down the line. It is very ambitious. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, but I think that the, the STP's ambitions um, are really laudable. So I've said about early intervention, the emphasis on retaining and supporting our existing staff, releasing staff that we do have so they're doing the jobs they want to do and not getting caught up in other stuff. Um, return to practice is significant. International recruitment, it will always be part of the picture. Um, the talent pool, we need to do much better at talent management than we do and give people visible career pathways to keep them in professions and make uh, careers more attractive to them, and so on and so forth. So in terms of what we've done regionally, um, each region, and there's, we're working to four regions at the moment, there's four people like me around England working with Lisa to, develop, to deliver this around the country. There are, there are very tight regional plans that are informed by the 44 STP plans around the country. Um, and we are being held quite tightly to the delivery of those plans. So working very much um, collaboratively with NHSE and NHSI around how we are sure that this is going in the right direction. And it's a very, very difficult thing to grab a hold of, particularly as, as I've already said, we're not just looking at NHS staff here. We're looking at the, the wider workforce. The plans are developed... Um, we are collecting data. There's another slide on that later. It's a little bit fraught how we do that, uh, but we're making progress. So at, at, at present, it's fair to say that, that we're on track with that. And just to give you a little bit of information about how the regions kind of stack up, those are the, the kind of re required growth targets. If you chunk stepping forward up, rather bluntly, it has to be said, into regional chunks, those are the kind of targets for, for the new roles that we're looking for. Oh, sorry, I didn't do that. 
Um, and then in the, the, the final column, um, you've got what the STPs are currently working to, and you'll see that there's a difference in the numbers, and that's because of the differentiation in how people want to deliver the plans. Another example where you get variation is that some people would say, why would we establish 300 new posts if we've got 400 vacancies already? Let's fill our vacancies and establish 150 new posts, because that's actually a more sustainable model. So there's lots of ways which locally people are in interpreting um, this. Just keeping an eye on the time here. Um, I mentioned about supply not being the be-all and end-all, but it is useful just to give you a sense of the scale of supply into the workforce. So that slide shows you that between eight and nine and a half thousand people join the mental health workforce each year, and this is predominantly NHS because this is mental health nursing, clinical psychology, psychiatry, all of, all of the recognisable mental health professions across the four regions of the country. So there are a huge number of people joining the workforce each year and there are a huge number of people leaving the workforce each year and one of the challenges about this is how we try to close that gap that graph just shows the, the, the totals by region in a slightly different way so in terms of the regional workforce plans um, and and the next steps um, I've said that each of the regions is broadly on track I'd say the main area of pushback and challenge from the regions is from chief executives and others in the system saying we don't actually necessarily believe that commissioners are going to adjust what they're doing and what they're spending in a way that's going to enable us to employ, employ 20,000 more people or our share of that 20,000 more people. And that's a very, very valid challenge. We're working very closely with NHSE and with the STPs, but we know how fraught the system is and how financially sort of challenged the system is to just assume as a chief exec of a whack and great mental health trust that you're going to get the money in your establishment to employ x hundred more nurses is that's quite a leap of faith um so where you do get a challenge and reservation i think it's very valid but i think where we are is that people would say if everything is as it's planned to be yes we're on track to do this we, we can do it um, there's a big uh, emphasis around new roles which i'll talk briefly about in a moment and it's worth mentioning that um we are engaged very heavily with the, with the development of the long-term plan, and I think we will see a lot more emphasis on some of this in the long-term plan, and certainly children and young people you know, being emphasised more strongly. But I don't think we'll see a dramatic step away from, from, from where we're going with this. I'm not in the inner circle there, but this is just what, what we're hearing um, on the wires. So in terms of new roles, there's a sort of big target of 8,000 people for new roles into mental health. They might be the nursing associate role, which we want to push, and we've got a lot of appetite from, from employers to push in mental health, including in, in other sectors, in social care and care homes and places like that. Peer support workers. People are very, very interested in, in expanding the number of peer support workers that we have. Um, new roles in crisis and liaison. Roles for analysts and non-clinical staff that will help the system flow better. Lots of different sorts of people working in primary care, again, to help with the early intervention and the prevention agenda physician associates and so on and so forth. So there are huge programmes of work going on and if you're interested in any of that stuff or think that you can help or want to know more, again, do get in touch with me and I will put you in touch with a person who you can have a discussion with about that. This is another interesting graph. This shows um, the number of interventions that are being funded, frankly, um, each year to help to upskill and reskill people in the workforce to help them to do different, better um, more um, transformational mental health roles. So if you see in 16 and 17, we're well into the six and a half, seven thousands of people that are accessing funding, predominantly from HE, but from other places as well, to help them. It may be a, an A&E &E nurse who wants to do some credentialing in, in uh, liaison, something like that, or people reskilling um, in order to enable them to um, care better for people in a, in a mental health setting, for people's physical health needs, to stop people moving around the system, anything and everything. But it's a huge part of the agenda. I think we should be really proud of those numbers and the impact that that is, that is making. And obviously the 2018 numbers are very low because we have only got kind of the first quarter of data. So I mentioned that collating the data is a challenge. Um, we are about to publish uh, an assurance dashboard Trying to grab data from all those non-NHS employed sectors is difficult, but we're doing it. We've done it already and we'll continue to do it. So when that is published, do have a look at it. You'll be able to look by STP, you'll be able to look 
by different geographies, you can look nationally, by regions, and we can see to what extent we're, we are on track with the trajectory that we need for this growth. I can see the time that I'm running out, so I'm just going to summarise um, now. So my email address and my Twitter uh, account and so on are on that slide if anybody wants to um, get in touch with any other questions or contacts. Um, but what I wanted to get across in this presentation is firstly that this, I firmly believe, represents a fabulous opportunity to make a difference to the care that patients receive, the services that they're able to access, and also to the environment that we're offering to our workforce. Um, it's very challenging, but we've never had uh, mental health high up on the agenda like this in workforce, so we're absolutely determined to make, take full advantage of the, of the opportunity this presents. It's all about system-wide collaboration. There's no blame game in this. There's no, well, NHSE didn't do that, HE should have done this. It's a complete system-wide collaboration, and the partnership working that's come out of this has been... Um, something that we want to model across other programmes of work because it's felt really dynamic and very positive. I wanted to emphasise that growth is not supply. G supply is part of growth, but growth is much wider than that. Um, and so to, for anybody to sort of take a message back, it's retention, retention, retention. How do you make your environment an environment that people want to stay in? Um, and what can we do to support that? Um, and also that these exciting new models for service delivery and different ways of thinking about delivering care to people are really at the heart of this strategy. Thanks very much.